All right, so before I begin, just want to talk a little bit about some general foraging tips um, before we talk about what to forage. So it's really important to only gather only common plants in the area. So if a species is endangered, maybe don't take it, just let it live and never take more than 5% of the population because we want to honor and respect the land to only take what we need. And also to not gather plants from protected or heavily used areas such as parks or nature preserves. And also it's really important to know which part of the plant that you need. It isn't always necessary to kill the entire plant to use it. You can just take parts of it and use that to forage. And as well, if you're gathering a plant for food, always taste a sample because sometimes we think we'll like the plant, but it's actually something we don't really like and it's a little like bleh. So it's really important just to sample it first, make sure you like, especially with berries and things like that. And especially in Ontario, it's really, really important because so much of our plants here look exactly the same. So it's really, really important to know only gather the plants when you're certain of the identity. So there's a lot of irritating and poisonous plants that grow wild here. And some of them really uh, resemble edible or medicinal plants. And if you live in Toronto, some really good places that I personally like to forage are around the Don Valley, the Humber River, and you can find some few things in Hyde Park as well. It's important to go in areas that aren't too in the city because the plants will absorb the air. And sometimes the city air isn't too good. So it's good to go in nature areas so you know that you're consuming you know, good air in your plants. And as well, I recommend just getting a field guide of any local area that you're, you're in and just carrying it along with you as you go on your foraging adventure. I really like physical books because it's nice to just flip through and you can kind of compare with the leaf or with the leaf patterns. So you really know exactly what you're foraging. And as well, I love, love, love to press um, flowers into books. And then once they're pressed, I like to place them in photo albums. So it's a good way if you're more into collecting stuff, it's a good way to uh, keep them storaged and you can write little labels and just you know preserve them for as long as you want. And you can go on to the next slide. And so as well with foraging, there's also, again, with the poisonous plants around you. Um, these are two common ones that I found a lot when um, foraging that are kind of in the way of other plants. So a one that is very common is poison ivy. Of course, we know we'll get the itch, we get the rash. So just be careful, know how to identify it and know how to treat it if you do get um, some poison ivy. And a really, really um, invasive one is the giant hogweed. Um, it's quite a distinct shape and it's really large and quite common in Ontario. And the leaves do cause quite an intense burn. So just be really careful if you're digging through bushes or things like that, that you're not touching the giant hogweed. And just be aware of like walking through long grass. You wanna make sure you're not getting you know, ticks on you. Always check for ticks, they're really, um, intense this year so just be careful when you're in the woods and yeah that's just a little you know disclaimer so no one gets hurt and you can go on to the next slide now we'll start talking about some plants so the first one i'm going to talk about is pokeweed so pokeweed is a really funky looking plant um, the young leaves are really uh, are edible and they're quite tasty after being boiled in two charges of water just to remove the toxins and the berries are poisonous and so do not eat the berries. And both, both the Iroquois and the Mousy tribes gathered the shoots in the springtime and then ate them as greens. It's really known for its immune st uh, stimulating antiviral and anti-inflammatory and antifungal properties. And you can also make a red dye from the ripe berries and has been used to color wine and to um, kind of cover foods. And the fruits and seeds are said to be an important source of food for morning doves and other songbirds. So maybe you plant this in the garden, you'll attract some really beautiful songbirds. And the term poke actually comes from the word pokan or cocoon, which resembles an Algonquin term for a plant that contains a dye. So it has a really beautiful dye color. And you can go on to the next slide. And this is another one of my favorites. I love, love, love goldenrod. Um, goldenrod plants have been cooked like spinach. It's been added to soups, stews, and casseroles. The flavor and the texture really varies the species of uh, goldenrod and the age and the habitat. 
The dried flowers have been used to make a really, really beautiful tea. The flowers are also edible and provide a really attractive garnish for salads. And the seeds can be gathered as a survival food and used to thicken stews and gravies. And last year when I was foraging, I noticed because it kind of peak around maybe early to mid fall. I noticed there was like plenty, plenty goldenrod everywhere. So yeah, so if you just, they're quite a distinct um, flower to look for and they're really, really beneficial. And the tea has been used for so many years to relieve really intestinal gas or cramps. And, but also if you're allergic to other plants in the aster family, um, you may be allergic to goldenrods because they are a fall allergen that's quite common to some people. And as well, you can use the beautiful yellow flowers as a dye. If you want to dye your clothing this type of color, you can use some goldenrod for that. And you can go on to the next slide. So another one, which is actually quite prevalent right now, if you're just looking around um, the city or even just sidewalks and cracks, and this just grows everywhere. Um, and people think it's just like a silly weed, but they're actually really, really edible and probably more nutritious than most of the greens that we eat. The young leaves can be eaten raw in salads and sandwiches, and it has a similar taste to Swiss chard. So if you like Swiss chard, you'll probably like this wild plantain. And the seeds can actually be dried and ground into meal or flour for use in bread or pancakes. And it's really, really rich in vitamin A, C, and K. And I use it mostly because it's really beneficial for insect bites, stings, mosquito bites, sunburn, snake bites. Because uh, once the leaves are applied to the skin, they really provide healing and they have anti-inflammatory properties. So, you know, if you're outside in the woods and you forgot your mosquito spray or whatever you forgot, you can just use it to cover some bites and that will provide some relief. And you can go on to the next slide now. And another one that is cool is burdock. Um, these plants are really large uh, vitamin rich plants and iron rich plants. And they're actually originally bought to North America as food plants. And now they kind of grow almost everywhere. Um, all parts of this plant are edible and the young leaves have been used in salads or boiled as a pot herb. And in order to break down the tough fibers around the leaves, you may have to boil it twice with some baking soda, but they're really, really tasty in soups and stews. And the mashed roots of this plant can be formed into patties and fried. So they're really, really yummy. And of course, along with being yummy, they're widely used in tonics, known for you know, purifying the blood. And they're really, really powerful liver tonic. And actually, I don't know if anyone has like walked through maybe a kind of a crowd of these bird dogs and they got them stuck to you. Um, but the bristles uh, have actually inspired the invention of Velcro. So that's kind of where they got inspired right from nature with the great burdock because I know so many times I've been in the woods and I come out and my entire leg is just covered with uh, burdocks. <laughs> um, but as well as a disclaimer, pregnant women and people with diabetes should not really use burdock because it could cause miscarriage or spotting. And if you have sensitive skin, you may develop a rash from the burdock, you know, prickly. So yeah, just be careful and like do your research before consuming some of these plants because they do are very high in certain vitamins that your body may not always need. And you can go on to the next slide. So asters are also one of my favorites. You know, every plant's my favorite, but asters especially because they're really beautiful and they're an ideal remedy for colds and fevers. And the root tea was used by First Nations as a way to treat headaches, body pain, fevers, and also taking internally to treat diarrhea. And it's a great, great, great pollinator plant that's noted to attract wildlife and is also used as a love medicine, if you're into that. <laughs> and you can go on to the next slide. And the next plant we have, which I have seen quite a bit recently, so now's the time, it's called Wild Carrot, Queen's Ant Lace. It also has a lot of um, poisonous or not edible um, duplicates, so just make sure you know exactly what you're identifying before you consume it. Um, it's the ancestor of the garden carrot, similar to the carrot, the tape root of Queen's Ant Lace is edible when young, but becomes too tough when it's in, in the second year and a little bit too fibrous. Um, 
So it looks similar to deadly water hemlocks or poison hemlocks. So those are the two copycats of Queensland's lace. So just be careful when you're foraging for them as well. And the First Nations use an infusion of this plant as a wash to treat swelling and a root, a part of the root was taken, taken for a lack of appetite to kind of bring back your appetite. So it's quite a powerful plant and really pretty as well. And you can go on to the next slide. And these are my favorite because there's a mulberry tree right near my house. And it was a really yummy you know, couple of weeks where I got to eat them every morning. <laughs> and yeah, so mulberries are really super delicious fruit, which is somewhat kind of like a mix between a blackberry or, and a black currant. Um, the leaves of the white mulberry trees are the main source of food for silkworms in Eastern Asia. And they've been cult cultivated for thousands and thousands of years in China as part of the silk industry as long, as, as long ago as um, 3rd century BC. And the Chinese silk actually caught the eyes of the Romans who encountered them on the well-known you know, Silk Road journey. Um, the red mulberry tree is actually endangered in Canada and is the only mulberry that is native to this country. And it frequently um, creates a hybrid with its European cousin, the white mulberry. And this genetic alteration is probably the single greatest threat to the red mulberry trees. The hybrids are sometimes difficult to identify, so be careful and just watch what the animals are eating. If you see a bunch of squirrels and birds and all sorts of things, you know, munching on this tree, then you can probably eat it too. <laughs> um, the red mulberry has um, leaves that are hairy um, at the bottom and the fruits turn from red to dark purple to almost black, and it's native to Southern Ontario. So it grows in moist, rich forests and floodplains, and maybe you might see them in some older neighborhoods as well. And I'm just gonna pause and see if anybody has any questions before I move on. Is it okay to unmute and speak, or do you want me to put my question in the chat? Uh, yeah, type in the chat, whatever you like. Okay, well, my question, you did mention that the uh, the wild carrot, Queen, Queen's Anne lace, yeah. is similar to another plant that is um, sort of uh, toxic. Yeah. Can you repeat the name of that uh, plant and how we can differentiate the two? Yeah, absolutely. So it's water hemlocks and or poison hemlocks. Um, and the best way I would recommend is just um, having a picture out and just kind of looking at the leaves of the of the plants and just making sure that they're not, you know, similar to the other ones because they do look super, super similar. Okay, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, no problem. And I don't think all mulberries are edible. I'm not sure which ones are not, but I know for sure that the red mulberries are. And yeah, so I'm not too sure on the hybrids if they're edible to eat, but yeah, I know for sure the red mulberries are good to go. And the white ones may not be as like uh, ready. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions before I move on? All right, cool. I will check in again in a bit and you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so now we'll talk about sumacs. Uh, sumacs are, I think, one of the most beautiful, really pretty flowers. Um, they're really red, uh, colorful fruit clusters in the plant. Can be really made into a really nice, refreshing pink or rose colored drink with a lemon-like flavor. It's really beautiful, really tasty. Um, the roots of the sumac was used to sore, soothe sore throats and the root bark is used for healing ulcers and open wounds. And you can apply the leaves to rashes and skin reactions. But if you're hypersensitive to any poisonous members of this genius, such as poison ivy, you may be allergic to sumac. So just yeah, make sure before you consume that you're not allergic to other members of this uh, family. But they are quite common sumac trees and they could be found along the water. Um, so I've seen a couple in the city in more greener areas. But yeah, sumac is really beautiful. And they usually flower around like early fall, late summer is maybe when you'll see them to start to really flower and the colors really popping. And you can go on to the next slide. And another one that's really beautiful are wild roses. So wild roses 
petals can actually be eaten alone or as a trail nibble. It can be added at the salads, teas, and you can also eat the rose leaves, the roots, and the peeled twigs of the rose. Um, and the most common types you can find in Ontario are the large hip rose and the prickly wild rose and the prairie rose. And on the right side, we have rose hips. So rose hips can be eaten fresh or dried using tea, jam, jelly, syrup, or wine. And, it, and rose hips actually contain as much vitamin C as an orange. So they're really, really good and really beautiful and really tasty. And, and I know a lot of people make a lot of um, salves and tinctures with them as well. So yes, rose, rose hips and roses are really beautiful and cool. <laughs> and you can go on to the next slide. So on the left, we have watercress and the, also, yeah, on the left we have watercress and on the right we have yellow crest. So these plants are considered microgreens and they can be eaten raw in salads and sandwiches, but they can also be steamed and boiled or stir fried like spinach. Um, common watercress is considered to have better flavors, but they all taste pretty good if you're into greens. Um, watercress that's fresh or dried is really, really good in casseroles or stews. And the flowers can make a nice little peppery addition to salads. They can also be used to treat blisters in the mouth or canker sores. And they're really common between March and October. And if you look at marshes, moist habitats, there's tons of creeks and streams in Ontario. So look around there and you'll probably find some watercress or yellow crests and enjoy a nice little meal with them. And you can go on to the next slide. So next we have St. John's wort, which is quite a popular um, medicinal herb. Um, it grows all throughout Ontario in pastures, edges of woods, abandoned fields, and is native to North America. The plant itself has been used for centuries, and this herb is really, really good for treating symptoms of depression, PMS, and it's a really good mood booster because the ingredient in the herb that causes this, it, it's called um, hypersin and hyperforin. It can really increase the production of serotonin in your brain. And like personally, I've used St. John's wort and it's helped me a lot with like my mental health. And it's a really, really powerful herb and it can be used as salves or even tinctures and yeah, anything at all. And the flowers you can use, the leaves. Um, and yeah, it's really cool. But if you are on any like anti-depression medication, look into it because um, there could be some conflict with using St. John's wort and some anti-depression meds. So just make sure you're safe before you're consuming and just mention it to your doctor that you're interested in taking this. And you can also be found, you know, at Shoppers Drug Mart and stuff. I think they have capsules of St. John's wort as well. And for your garden, St. John's wort is also awesome because it stabilizes the soil. And if you're into like edging your garden or making boundaries in your garden, it's great because it doesn't spread and it just makes a really distinct barrier between your stuff. And you can go on to the next slide now. And another really awesome one that I use quite frequently is the stinging nettles. Um, these plants are found in moist, rich soil. So if, again, looking along the edges of rivers and streams or on old farmlands is a really good place. Um, I found a lot in my parents' house because our house is located on an old um, apple orchard. So the soil is super, super, super rich. So that's why there's like, there's so much growing just, you know, as it is. So yeah, I find looking into the history of where your, your area is and seeing what was there before, if it was old farmland or if it was just like, you know, blank land, that will help you with your foraging because you know kind of like the richness of the soil. And hence the name stinging nettles. They do have really tiny hairs on them. So it's really good to wear gloves when harvesting them. The leaves, the stems and the roots can all be harvested. And the best time to harvest is when they're small before they start to flower. And if you do get any stinging nettles on you, I know I've gone some and this really sucks. <laughs> you can just get some scotch tape and you know take the nettles out and rub some aloe on it just to soothe the skin after like the burn. And you can also use it as a hair tonic and a skin toner. You can make it into that. I think there's a bunch of you know recipes online for that. And because of its really high silica and sulfur content, it makes your skin clear and your hair shinier and just making everyone look super beautiful and fancy. And it's a really good preventative for seasonal allergies as well. Because I struggle with seasonal allergies really badly. It's nice if you start to take them 
maybe two, three months before the allergy season. And then that will be a nice preventative from making, you know, the sneezing or the eye watering or whatever your symptoms are be a lot less. And it's also a really, really good direct substitute for spinach or, or any type of dish with spinach. You can make pesto or, you know, whatever you like. And it loses its sting once you cook it. And it's very, very high in protein. So if you are plant-based, it's really good to get your proteins in with sticking nettles. And it's also really, really great during your moon cycles or menstruation. And it's a really strong detox if you're into detoxing. And it also lowers blood pressure as well. So it's quite a powerful plant that grows quite abundantly here in Southern Ontario. And then the last plant I'll cover today is my favorite. Um, uh, it's called spruce tips. I think they're more common maybe up north and more in like bigger wooded areas. Um, they're a bright green color and they're really high in vitamin C and they have such, some of them have a really, really delicious kind of lemon spicy chickeny taste. They're really delicious. Um, and it's actually a really common ingredient and in, I don't know if anyone's had a Canadian gin martini. They use spruce tips to add a little like, you know, spice to it. And they're really great in teas and so you'll know when they're ready to pick when they're bright green with a brown shell and a light green color. And but it's also the new growth of the tree. So you just want to take, again, what you need, even though they're super yummy and you want to eat the whole tree, but the tree needs it to keep on growing. So just, yeah, take only 5%. And so Engelmann's, Engelmann's spruce is my favorite because that's the one that has that lemony, chickeny type of taste. But any fir, spruce, pine tips can all be eaten, but they all have different flavors. Some of them are more like sour, some of them are more sweet. It just really depends on the tree. And yeah, so I'll just talk a little bit about storage and things as well before we get to the questions and sharing. Um, I really like the app um, iNaturalist because you can upload pictures of your findings and identify them, as well as you can see people in your area, what they have found around you. And then this makes it kind of a quick identification because you're like, oh, I can go to this place and then I can go on iNaturalist and I can see all the other people that forage in this area. And then it's really easy for me to go and identify like what's what and then come home with my great forage goods. And I just like to go with a basket or a little bag. And then you can dry out your herbs just by hanging them to dry or you can use a dehydrator and you can make tonics, tinctures, salves. There's lots of way you can use to um, keep your items that you forage. And yeah. And just move on. Yeah, iNaturalist. And I'm just gonna answer some questions. So again, with the identifying the poisonous versus non-poisonous, because they look so similar, I usually just go with a picture of the ones that are like edible and the ones that are not edible. And I just kind of put it side to side to make sure. So I have it in real time. Um, and you can make it into a drink by just like soaking the berries and um, adding them like you would, um, I'm trying to think, like you've made like a blackberry drink or something like that. You just kind of soak them and add some water. And, yeah. And singing nettle can be made into a tea. So you can start um, drinking tea like two or three months before the allergy season starts and then you can be okay, I hope. <laughs> And iNaturalist is the app, yeah. iNaturalist is really cool, and you can all add me on it. <laughs> and sumac, I usually just like soak the berries for a bit and then boil them. And have you ever gooped and it ate poison? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, have I ate something that was poisonous? Is that what, that, what you're asking? Yeah, Amanda? Do the um, spruce tips grow on those pine trees that have spikes? Yeah, yeah. So you'll see them if you, not the ones with the spikes, they're the pine trees that have a little bit, you know, softer. And then you'll see like a little, little tip. It's like- so oh. I think I've seen them. Do they turn pink? They turn, they're like bright green. Um, Adria, if you can go back to the slide of the spruce tips. I'm just gonna go back to the slide and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. Yeah, so you see here, you see how they're like bright green at the edge? 
Yes. Um, yeah. Do are they first pink? Um, they're like a little like brownish, pinkish, I guess. Yeah, they're like light brown. So yes, when the I've seen you seen them? Yes, I've seen them on the pine trees close to our house. Nice. Have you eaten them before? No, I had no idea they were edible. Yeah, they're really, really tasty. And if you're on a hike and you see them and you're like, oh, I'm so tired, I want food, you just eat some and give you some a little boost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you can just eat the spruce tips as like right off the tree. <laughs> or you can like saute them or you know, all that. It's up to you. But they taste they taste really good just off the tree. And no, I've been very lucky not eating something poisonous, you know. I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm usually I usually bring a lot of like field guides with me. I have like, this is a really awesome one. It's like edible medicinal plants in Canada. And then, yeah, just with some other like little pocket guides that I bring with me when I go foraging, just because I don't feel like dealing with being poisoned. <laughs> um, I personally have never used any of the dried burrs of the burdock. But I'm sure you can, yeah, find something to use for that. But yeah, I'm not too sure about the dried burdock. So if you use something poisonous, yeah, go to the hospital and identify immediately like what it is. And um, yeah, just be super careful with foraging, especially in Ontario, since a lot of things look the same and there's a lot of duplicates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just type out non. Um, so edible and medicinal plants of Canada. So yeah, edible medicinal plants of Canada is a really good field guide, but there's a lot of other ones that are like smaller for like each region. So this one's specific for Southern Ontario, some for North, some for the East Coast, some for the West. But yeah, I think books are the best way to go. If you're like going out with a book, it's a lot easier than having to rely on internet. Cause sometimes you don't get internet when you're in the woods. And I would use iNaturalist as like a good kind of like general per area identification but yeah picture this is really cool um but still yeah a book is the best way to identify and also going with someone who has maybe forest area before that can help you out if you have some questions especially with the greens and I also have some questions for your, you folks as well if anybody has any foraging tips to share or if anybody has any cool things they forage this summer already, I would love to hear from it because yeah, I think everybody has a cool story to tell and maybe some cool tips and we can all still learn from each other. And how to connect with foragers. Um, I think Facebook is honestly, you know, Facebook's still good. There's a lot of, I'm in a Facebook group called um, Foragers of Ontario and that's, people are just posting stuff all the time and yeah, it's really cool. Oh, I'll re retype the edible and medicinal. Oh, chill cherries. Nice. Linden Blossom. Oh, I've never, never heard of that one. That sounds such a beautiful name. <laughs> Linden Blossom. But yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and yeah, talk as well. Yeah, where can I find Linden Blossom? It just, yeah, I'm pretty sure service berries have a poisonous twin as well. I think most berries, I kind of go with most berries in Ontario probably have a poisonous twin because it's Ontario. <laughs> I found some chanterelle mushrooms in the forest by my house. No way, shelters are so yummy. I'm so jealous. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm gonna cook those up. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, chanterelles are such yummy, yummy, yummy mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the weather's been great for the mushrooms too. It's been kind of cool and rainy. So. Yeah. Uh, 
calendula is beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Kyla, for coming. Yes, yes, nostrums are so yummy and so spicy and um, delicious for salads. We have some at the farm and it's really good. Yeah, this time is just for any discussion or any other questions. So if you don't have any more questions, you're free to go. And I appreciate everybody for coming out this time. Thank you. Any plants recommended for gardening? Um, anything you like, anything you feel like uh, planting. There's some people that are really into, you know, trying to plant a mango tree in the middle of Ontario. It's, yeah, it's up to you, whatever you feel like planting, but I really like to start off with herbs because it is simplest to grow and you can get so much out of herbs and tomatoes. Tomatoes are really popular. Cucumbers, zucchini, blueberries, strawberries. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Thank you everybody for coming out. It's awesome. Yeah, I'll put the, I'll do a little follow-up email and I'll put all the book names in there as well. So I'll be prepared and forage and hopefully, yeah, hopefully in September we'll I'll organize um, a little foraging trip at the farm and then we can all hopefully talk in person about all the cool plants. <laughs> Thank you everybody. In, in terms of the nasturtium, I tried growing it um, and it was just about to blossom. Yeah. And then I, I checked the next day and the whole thing was gone. Oh, no. So I'm sure the wildlife got to it before me. But I'm wondering, is there what is a natural, um, safe, friendly way of keeping uh, the animals at bay, um, the wildlife at bay? Yeah, well, um, a good thing that I learned from, from my mom is you can use garlic. So making a garlic spray, you can like kind of like soak up the garlic in um, water and then just use it to spray around your plants or anything spicy. So if you have any chilies or, you know, hot peppers, like they don't like spicy stuff. So putting that around your plants as well. And honestly, um, any pure soap you can find, like the Dr. Castile soap is really good. You can use that to um, spray around your plants as well to keep them, keep those pesky rabbits and raccoons away. Okay, and you recommend that once a week or a month, once a month, like how often? Um, it depends on how pesky your pests are. <laughs> oh, they're pesky. <laughs> yeah, they're quite intense. I probably do it like, you know, three or four times a week, depending on like the animal. But yeah, that, then they'll learn. <laughs> All right, and one final question. Do you know if rabbits eat the leaves of um, uh, rhubarb? Hmm. I'm not too sure, actually. I'm not too okay. sure. Because some not... things, something's gnawing away at my rhubarb leaves and I can't figure out what it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I feel like rabbits eat quite a lot of green <laughs> in the gardens. So <laughs> most of the time I assume things are just rabbits if they have little like bites. Um, yeah, they're little bites. Yeah. They're prob probably rabbits. I can't think of any. Or squirrels. Okay. It wasn't there previous year, so I was just wondering yeah. what's going on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been really informative. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you have some baby rabbits in your neighborhood because usually baby rabbits like Yeah, to they're all over. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Human hair. You can use human hair to prevent. I would like to hear more about that, Kamika. If you want, because dog hair works as well. If you have dogs or cats, that works if you put it in the soil. Yeah, interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, because they smell they smell the animal and assume that it's in the area, and that keeps them away. That's so smart! Wow. Huh. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Blood meal. What's blood meal, if you don't mind me asking? Larissa. Hello. Oh, you're muted. Now you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm so bad at this. Um, <laughs> it's something that I was actually told about by my neighbor. I got it at the garden store. So it's just like a, um, like that you would put on your vegetable garden, like a supplement for the plants, but oh. if it smells like death, it keeps all oh. of the animals away. <laughs> oh, okay. What is it made out of? Is it just like? Blood. Oh, blood. It's like actually blood. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like a byproduct of the meat industry. 
Oh, it's like wow. just dried. It's like granules. Oh yeah, yeah. Beef, beef byproduct. Um, huh. Yeah, I made that face too. <laughs> but <laughs> it really is. <laughs> like, I'm just interested to see how that would smell. I know it's all bad, but I just want to smell it just to see. At first, it's kind of gross, but then it goes away. But it really keeps the animals away. Yeah, I can imagine. Probably will keep me away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, blood meal. You just sounds so intense. You know. <laughs> well, good to know that these things exist. I would not have thought. Eggshells, yeah, eggshells are really cool. Good too. Blood meal. Hmm. Yeah, and if anyone has any more questions, uh, you can unmute yourself or just anything they want to say. It's cool as well. Or you can go. It's up to you. <laughs> I will be here. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You can probably stop recording now. Add your as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>